Hello and welcome back to the Agassino Zinger Show with me, your friend, Agassino Zinger. And this is episode number 387. That's 387 of the Agassino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino. How's it going? How are you feeling? Great, amazing, good. How am I? Same old, same old. Hanging in on there with a glass of water and a smile. As per usual, if it's your first time checking out the show via YouTube, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below. And if you're listening via the podcast app, leave me a five-star review, download the show, and share it with all your family and friends. And of course, you can also support the show via Patreon. You'll find the links in the description below, as well as the pinned comment on top of this video. So, what's been occurring? England played football. Um, Somebody fought in the UFC. People are dying. Houses are on fire. <laughs> what else has been happening? Kids in university halls are being dosed with the incorrect, you know, levels of drugs due to this, you know, poor administration that we have going on in the government at the moment. Loads of mad stuff is going on. But as per usual, this is your respite from all that nonsense. A bit of an hour of, you know, some um, internet cultural commentary from yours truly. So strap on, strap in, grab yourself a little drink, serve it a nibble on, and let's get in with the show. So, first thing, um, a bit of an annoyance, I guess, in that regard, in terms of Manchester United, there's been been a, there's a there's a leak in the camp. It appears like so obviously off the back of the six one loss against Tottenham, which I still haven't gotten over to be honest. I think the club has, I think the club's moved on. I think no one really cares at the boardroom level. For the most part, you know, they're okay with us playing Champions League football and facing such illustrious names and clubs such as PSG and Red Bull Leipzig. Um, they care about that and what it means to the brand. They care about that and what it means to the marketing uh, possibility, you know, the marketing potential of that encounter. But in terms of actually winning a trophy, they don't care. So it's no surprise that now the entire club is in disarray. We've essentially got a manager who's underqualified in Ole Gunnar Solskjaer to have the job in the first place. But, you know, he did a good job. He got us to finish fourth. We, um, even though um, he got us to finish the top four, even though we kind of, you know, crawled all over the finishing line at the end there. And we only really finished in the top four due to other teams around us not being able to put together a sustained period of form in order to clinch that position. But we did it. Doesn't matter how we did it, we did it. So when this uh, average manager pulls out a pretty extraordinary result in getting us to finish the top four, you'd think the first thing they'd want to do is improve on that, right? Try and, um, you know, correct the wrongs of the season by, of the season just gone and try and make some kind of challenge or be a disruptor in a league. No one's, no United fan is going to be naive enough to think, oh, we're going to be able to challenge for the league title in a couple of years. That's not going to happen, right? Football comes in cycles. This is probably our cycle of being shit. So we probably need to um, accept that sooner rather than later. But at least be a, a team that can, you know, upset the odds, you know, that can throw a team off track, that can be able to disrupt fingers a little bit, you know, maybe sustain a good run of form that has us being top for like half of the season and we kind of fall off towards the end. Just give us something to shout about. No one's expecting us to win the league. Just give us something to shout about. So the board, you know, they have one job. Back your manager, get him, get him his targets, and then uh, again we go. And if anything, if you think about it, really, from a purely selfish and um, self-preservation point of view, if you're somebody in the boardroom and you get your manager the targets that they want, and then they still fail at the job, you've literally got they've literally got a no one leg they can stand on. They've got no point of recourse. They've got nothing they can say that they've been agreed by. Nothing, zero. As long as you give them ample time to perform, and you give them the signings that they need. If they don't perform within, of course, a prerequisite set of times, you know, maybe some terms you set out in the terms, hey, you've got two seasons to get us back to here or three seasons to do this, fair enough. But if you're able to give them the targets and give them the time and the space to do their work and they still fail, of course, move on to another coach. But at the moment, we've got Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, who's clearly not capable of doing the job, not being supported in the transfer market and having to play with a team that's made up of what, three ex-managers, players in there? You've got Mourinho players in there. You've still got a couple. Maybe Do you have any Van Gaal players there? Well, Van Gaal era style players, I say. Maybe a few left over from the David Moyes era are still there, like Juan Mata, right? He's one that's probably still around. He's having to kind of, um, you know, sort of work him into a team even though Juan Mata hasn't played in a while. But still, you'd think they tried to support him, but they don't. And, I'm, and now Solskjaer is in a position where he's having to pick players he clearly didn't buy. 
you know, we can see, uh, you know, as been proven with the lack of first team opportunities that Donny van der Beek has, has been given in the first team. He clearly wasn't an Ole Gunnar Solskjaer buy. He clearly was a buy, um, you know, initiated by whoever's in charge of the football transfers at our club at the moment. It's not a football director. It's not a director of football. It's just whoever's in charge of it. Whichever one of Ed Woodward's friends gets the opportunity to do that job, bought for Donny van der Beek and probably ended up buying someone like an Igala, right? Sasha wanted, um, what's his face? Not Callum Wilson. Who's the other dude that bought him? He wanted Josh King, who he previously worked with, or he's got some connection with due to his agent. It's a little Scandi connection there. He didn't get him, so we got Odin Nigala. So it's no surprise now that these stories are leaking out in the press. And this is from the United Report. It says the following An unnamed Manchester United staff, Mache staff from Bruno Fernandes, half time against Tottenham. And as, you, as you're aware, we were losing, what was it, 4-1? Or was it 4-0, actually, at the halftime or something? You know, 4-1 or something stupid at halftime, down to 10 men and just playing, you know, horrible football, not going anywhere. And, of course, you know, none of the team looked like they were really giving a shit about the loss. They were sort of, like, taking it in their stride, not knowing how to react. And um, the only person that seemed to be really agreed by it was Bruno Fernandes, you know, and evidently so. As the league continues, he said... Bruno Fernandes laid into his teammates, accusing them of not upholding the proud name Manchester United. He kept yelling, we're supposed to be Manchester United. This should not be happening. And that's true. It shouldn't be happening. But again, we're a team full of losers, managed by a loser, and of course, run by absolute losers. So we're going to get loser results. It continues. Unnamed Manchester United Smash Day staff said, it was clear that the manager also came under fire because he was going on about the wrong tactics. There were other raised voices, but his was the one which seemed to carry the main force. So that rumour was true. I remember when the match finished and we saw, or even when the teams came out a second, second half and we didn't see Matic or Bruno Fernandes, everyone kind of assumed they got into it in a change room. And now, you know, it's probably been led correct. Bruno Fernandes probably got into Matic for not covering his defenders. Um, and then when Ole Gunnar Solskjaer started speaking about tactics, which, you know, he's obviously not um, in any way, shape or form in a position to do so. Bruno Fernandes probably then pulled him up on it as well and said, hey, you've probably set us out the wrong way. And of course, him being the manager, he had to kind of, you know, uh, put his foot down and decided to hold him up at half time. But this was obviously, this was bound to happen. The moment the Glaciers or Edward decided not to back Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and transfer market, this is what we were going to get. We were always going to get this version of United. And as much as I don't like Ole Solskjaer, as much as I think he's a terrible coach, as much as I think he probably won't have another job in the Premier League again after he's fired by Manchester United. Um, I still think he is owed or is, is at least earned the right to attempt to try and get us further up the table with his players this go around just because of what he'd done last season. Now, some of the some people could say, oh, it wasn't him actually, it was a player, it's cool, whatever. He was still the person steering the ship. If he was in charge and he feels the one that was in, you know, in the captain's seat, in terms of getting us over the line and we did it, we did it. It doesn't matter how we did it, we did it. Don't get me wrong. Was it Vintage United? No. Was it probably, you know, uh, was it probably um, depression-inducing football? Yes, very much so. But we did it. We achieved it. We got him back into the Champions League ahead of some other teams who probably think they probably should have got in there. Arsenal being a big example. So why not give him the players that he wants? And again, if he doesn't do a good enough job, you've got a ready-made excuse to get rid of him. You gave him the time, you gave him the players and he didn't do what was needed. Now you go. But instead, they don't do that. And now we're going to be back to square one. Um, supposedly, we're being linked to Mauricio Pochettino. This is another report here from, again, from a United Report that says, Manchester United are mindful that Mauricio Pochettino will not be available forever. He also has admired at Manchester City. So you can imagine the tug of war going on at the moment, right? Manchester City are on a bit of a weird, you know, bit of form at the moment. People are questioning whether or not Pep Guardiola can recreate the magic of Man City. Can he, um, at some point, be able to put together a coherent or can, you know, a uh, functional defence that doesn't require him to spend excess of, what is it, a billion or something, close to a billion on defenders? Can he do that? And if so, and if he can't, then maybe you get another manager in. And the only manager out there at the moment who could probably do that job, especially in England, would be a Musha Pochettino, who you could actually trust to play a particular brand of football, you know, to give you a chance um, to improve the players that are available already at the team. There's not many managers that could do that. And unfortunately, again, for Oli, he's in a position where there's a ready-made replacement out there who's much better coach than him, right? There's no denying that, especially considering the fact that Oli's been in the game for, what, a decade or more, 
right? He has not really achieved that much. Um, and he's not really regarded. Of course, he's won a league title, which is more than what Pochettino can say. But winning a league title at Molde and keeping Southampton up in the Premier League are probably comparable, I'd say, in that regard. But that aside, that's going to be pressure that I don't think Solskjaer can handle. And with the next five games that we have coming up at the moment, right? I think I checked it earlier. There's some mad games that United are playing. Absolutely mad games. I don't actually see how this guy's ever going to survive. So it, this month might be the last month that we see Solskjaer in a dugout for United. And I honestly think he has no one to blame but himself. No one. He can't blame anybody else but himself. So when we get back from the international uh, break, what do we have here? This is from Google, right? Let's see if this is correct. So when we get back from the international break... We face, oh my God, yeah, Soul Shock is gone. We're facing Newcastle away from home. Then we've got uh, Paris Saint-Germain and Champions League away from home. Then we're back um, in the Premier League. We're facing Chelsea at home. So you've got Newcastle, Paris Saint-Germain, Chelsea, Rebel Leipzig and Arsenal. Are the five games that he's playing. And then it makes sense that they would probably get rid of him here just when we, you know, probably falter or we have a bad run of games. And then whoever the new manager is, the matches after Arsenal are against the Turkish team we're drawn with in the Champions League, um, away to Everton, at home to West Brom, then away again to the Turkish team, and then back away at Southampton. A far better run of results, a far better run of ma- of games to manage United than coming to manage United against Newcastle, Paris Saint-Germain, Chelsea, Red Bull, Leipzig and Arsenal. Again, scummy move by the board. I think if if Oli Solskjaer does end up getting fired, then there is an argument to be said. It's not an argument. Um, there is definitely some cause to be had there in terms of Ed Woodward also losing his job. If you sack Oli, you have to get rid of Ed Woodward. He's resided over, what, three four was it three now three failed managers in Van Gaal Mourinho and um Oli he can easily say hey David Moyes wasn't my pick because essentially Alex Ferguson got him that job but let's go from that from from Moyes onwards right Van Gaal Mourinho and Oli Solskjaer were all Edward the appointees they were all not given the framework or the structure necessary for them to and again that's funny thing is all three managers especially in Oli's case we would probably I would imagine Oli was really resistant to having a football director I think that's why we didn't get it in the end I can imagine him being a little bit arrogant about it and saying hey I would I trust in my own ability which you know is whether it's unfounded or not you know that's his own um he's allowed to think that but it's funny that all three of those managers could have would have benefited more from having a football director than any other manager we ever had or any other manager that we could have got. They need it more than any other. They need to have somebody that can, you know, steer the ship footballing wise so they can concentrate on the coaching in Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's case. I don't even think he's does anyway that proficiently sometimes you watch us play football and you're thinking to yourself what are these guys doing training all day it's a very very bizarre state of affairs but again let's see um that news obviously that leak has been interesting to see it, it makes me think that the leak quite could, could quite possibly come in from some of the newer players obviously they said it was a match day source there but that leak regarding um Bruno Fernandes and Matic and Oli having some sort of disagreement in change room which led to uh, Bruno and Matic coming off at half time was something that we heard right after the match finished so I'm sure this league is coming from some of the newer players in the team whether it's a Donny whether it's a Bruno Fernandes whoever is doing it they're definitely trying to put that news out there to put some pressure on the board or to maybe light a fire up the team and social arcs you know to kind of pull the, together the results because I'm indifferent I'm not really you know if social doesn't get fired I'm not going to lose my mind and jump out of a window but I'm also kind of on the line of thinking of if he's not the right mind for you, just get somebody else, right? Just so they can get started. I don't get this whole like waiting another five games. I get the five games are a bit more appetizing, the ones I just mentioned afterwards, right? If Tosha doesn't pass this five game test, then fair enough. But I still think I'd much rather give whoever's in charge the time and the space to do what they need to do to get the best results for our club. Um, I don't see how we should kind of essentially flail ourselves just so we can really really be sure that Solskjaer isn't the man for the job because we know we know he isn't we all know we all wished the sentiment was true we all wished um our 99 hero could somehow pull it out um you know put a rabbit out from the hat and sort of rewrite history and sort of like you know because that's the thing as well that's hard with Solskjaer too because we were around but we watched Cardiff get relegated that season when they were in the Premier League right 
and we saw how bad they played football, right? We saw the lack of like tactical innovation in Solskjaer's coaching. He wasn't being lauded or spoken about in the ways that, you know, a Chris Wilder spoken about. Um, what was his face at, um, at Brighton, the manager at Brighton? He's not spoken about in the same ways as, you know, um, Nuno at Wolves. He's just a manager that happens to coach United. He's not really regarded that well for his, you know, coaching expertise. So we all really hoped it would have worked out. It's not going to work out. I don't think so. I don't think this is ever going to change. Solskjaer is a pretty terrible coach. And unfortunately, he's at a club where he's not really being helped in any way, shape or form either. He's sort of being left to do it and handle it on his own. So I don't think this is going to end that well for him after this. So I fully expect us to move on, get Pochettino and, you know, hire somebody who can essentially work in a really tight budget or low budget and he can improve the players we have available and he's had to clear suit. So if anything, he ticks all the boxes that the Glaciers kind of want for this kind of new era of United and what we've kind of become over the last few years. We're not a winning machine in a way that Bayern Munich is where all oh, Bayern Munich are, oh, we are an efficient, you know, money-making machine. That's exactly what we are. We are somebody's marketing play toy, someone's marketing case study, and unfortunately, the football side of things is going to suffer. Next on the list, what do we have here? Oh, we have this really cool um, Mesa Margiela MM6. That's their, uh, what would you call it? Uh, would you call it a diffusion line? You would, right? But in fashion, they don't like referring to stuff as diffusion line, but whatever. Let's regard it as diffusion line. It's Margiela's diffusion line, and they're showcasing a collaboration that they did with North Face, which I think is quite possibly one of the best things I've seen in a long, long time um, when it comes to North Face collaborations. It kind of reminds me of similar stuff that Rick Owens did with Montclair, where you take a staple um, piece of clothing from you know a brand such as North Face or Montclair, and you reinterpret it in your own way without losing its essence. It's a really delicate balance really really difficult to get right but once you do get it right you get these really interesting results like this jacket here so it looks similar to um the north face denali right in the fact that it's got the zips that the underneath i think if you've ever worn one you would know that north face denalis have like the zips that go underneath your armpit so i'm assuming they're like ventilation zips or they might be extra extra uh, they might be like a modular system where you can clip on another jacket i'm not too sure but for the most part when i wore mine i'd unzip it here and there you know in order to kind of let some air through because you know those north face fleeces hold in the heat really really well but if you want to get some fresh air in the way to do it is to open the zip so i like that they've sort of like reinterpreted that idea and basically applied it in a sort of like weird KP fashion, which results in it being like when you once you take out your arms and you lay it flat on the floor, it's basically a circle, which is pretty cool in terms of the, the, the overall design. And something that I'm really kind of fond of. Um, I love when they do stuff like this, right? It's a collaboration, but they just go the extra mile just because they can. Um, of course, the logo is awesome on it as well. You got the little arm sleeves, which are a really interesting touch, right? So if you don't get the full jacket, or if you don't get the full jacket to the naked eye you do get in the pack what included these weird sort of like arm glove things that would probably make someone like Kamala Anthony wince you know what I mean it continues here another great outfit there we've got like a classic note face here I wonder if that's part of the collaboration too did he do his own twist on that or is that just something else no it is yeah it's a, it's a twist on a classic note face that's pretty impressive man again with the arm sleeves as well it looks pretty great you got an awesome bag. It's the same shape as the actual coat itself when it's laid flat and it turns into a scarf. No, that's pretty sick, man. That's pretty, pretty incredible. Um, and then again, turns into a backpack. So let's see some details regarding this. It says, we now take a close look at the MM6 Maison Margiela and the North Face Full Winter 2020 collaboration. Um, it, uh, unveiled earlier this year at London Fashion Week, the collection sees a number of cutwear pieces mixed with cold weather accessories. The color collection, the cover, so the overall collection asks to be layered and opens up possibility with unisex styling. In our styled um, takes, the we da, 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 what's it going to come out? It's going to come out on the eighth of October, um, over oh, eighth to the tenth over at MM6 Hong Kong. So yeah, pretty cool piece of item of clothing there. I'm all for that one. Then we have a pretty uh, funny video of some lads and lasses deciding to play cricket on the middle of Peckham High Street, which is, you know, 
it is what it is what can you do um but also maybe a sign of the times a sign of the fatigue and the general malaise that's seeping through this hallowed nation of mine people are just kind of fed up i think people are kind of over it they want to get back to their regular scheduled programming but unfortunately everywhere they turn things are closed you have to wear a mask you can't go near anybody so this is probably a natural reaction to it or this could be classified as unintended consequences right um unintended consequence but there is something that baffles me about this sort of stuff whereas uh, i think to myself surely someone within the house of parliament when they're drafting up this curfew would have kind of you know sat there for hold on if we force everyone out at a certain time won't there be more people on the streets than ever if we all close all pubs at the same time I, I'm, it just baffles me how no one thought of that especially considering how big of an issue you know um anti-social behavior is in some parts of england right whether it's up north down south you know further up in scotland you know across the pond there a little bit in ireland there's obviously an issue i think on these shores with people's um ability to hold their drink just and mostly in my opinion it's always been something i've kind of really been annoyed by because i think a lot of our great sort of you know cocktail bar establishment spots and stuff have essentially been uh forgotten in the past or essentially been you know put in a position where they were just bound to fail due to this negligent harmful and really destructive uh licensing law that prevents people from opening you know past the hour of 12 god forbid or sometimes even past the hour two it's just heinous why that isn't a thing it should be especially you know you could easily go as far as saying hey we give all bars and pubs the option to stay open until two or something and then if you want to keep it open later you apply for a normal late late license sorry but i also wouldn't mind if they were like hey we're going to give you this extra extension or we're going to give you they're going to change the terms on your deal but we also ask that you have to go above and beyond to make sure your space is safe right because i'm guessing if they agree to you know let you stay open until two the last thing they need is for you to get involved in some sort of passa passa and for that whole deal or for the way they signed it to be called into question no one needs that in it if there's one thing i've learned about working in the corporate industry and working in startups in general is that the one thing in common is that no one likes unnecessary hassle right no one wants to answer for the sins of somebody else and no one wants to be blamed for anything else either but yeah this is an interesting this is just a funny video people playing cricket on the street after they've been chucked out of the parks or sorry chucked out of the pubs i'm not sure if that's ice on the floor i think that might be uh, this is a protest from some of the key workers behind the scenes in the within the entertainment or nightlife industry you know so pouring the thing on the floor and look at people and i wonder what the odds are of dying from somebody hitting you with a cricket ball and actually dying from the jit getting covered i wonder what they are someone's bowling hitting the ball out there everyone looks like they're fucked off their head Jeez, that was a fast ball, wasn't it? I never quite got cricket either. It was never the sport for me. I, I enjoyed catching it sometimes here or there, but I just never got why people thought this was an interesting sport to even play. Even with your friends, it requires so much prep. Um, it goes on for flipping hours. You have to wear those dumb uniforms. It's just not the vibe. Oh. You need so yeah i'm sure we could have we all could have guessed that was going to happen no real big surprise there so again congratulations to our government you know thinking that it was a the best idea was to get everyone to come out at the same time because you know what that's what the uk needs we need everybody out in the same time everyone gallivanting around the streets whilst this virus still picks up steam especially now isn't it like you know yeah there's find things out there that say you're not meant to you can't get outside and stuff but it's like god damn it man surely there's got to be a better way to be using your time wherever it may be than doing this surely but hey again what do i know let's move on, let's move on. what else do we have here we have unfortunate news regarding Bauhaus, the Taiwanese hot pot that the hot spot, hot pot, hot spot that propelled Eddie Huang to fame and closes, unfortunately. 
um, I actually had the opportunity to go to about this is a shitty story and I had the opportunity to go but regardless um, I uh, missed my chance to go to Bauhaus when I first went to New York back in what 07 or whatever, whenever it was um, I remember passing it or we were outside it was a bit of a queue this was really in the beginning and it just seemed like a bit of hassle to go and then that was really at the what at the maybe at the start of the whole like steam bun trend in culinary industry was kind of pick kicking off especially with the food trucks and and all that good stuff and we just missed out or i missed our chance to go and i never obviously since that time i never really visited new york so there wasn't a chance to visit the spot but i know from keeping you know up to date with what's going on in the food industry what how big of an influence or how big of a of a role Bauhaus played in terms of you know maybe rewriting the narrative around Asian food or contemporary Asian food or modern Asian food or whatever it may be within the West um of course you know seeing somebody like Wei Li Wang as well on TV was a good thing I'm assuming for most Asian people coming up the fact that he was bucking the trend somewhat and pursuing his dreams doing it in a very authentic way telling his family a story through food was really really incredible and I think Bauhaus is a great summation of that especially considering you know that it was founded during kind of the heyday, the streetwear heyday, right? Back in the day with the retail mafia and all that malarkey. So it's kind of sad to see this um, leave and not be around anymore. But this is an article from uh, Eater that says the following, chef, author, and TV personality, Eddie Huang, has closed his new city apartment, restaurant apartment, the bar house at this establishment, that launched his career as chef and established him as an influential media personality, amplifying Asian American representation. Huang made an announcement on his Instagram account, writing that he tried to keep the restaurant located on 238 East 14th Street between 3rd and 2nd Avenue open as long as he could. Bat House originally opened in Lower East Side in 2009. Yep, that must have been around the time that I went to. When, yeah, I must have went in 2009. Then. That must have been his first year opened. Jesus Christos. Um, in Lower East Side. I also I remember also going to Lower East Side um, and checking out the original New York thing store. This was when I was in love with Aaron Bondroff and I happened to bump into um, Widow Dave. He was working in the store that day. It was pretty cool. Um, anyway, continues here. It says, um, Hedy Young really opened it Lower East Side in 2009. Um, serving its signature pillow, pillowy bows in pork belly and fried chicken, along with other Taiwanese fare like Lu like Lu Rao Fan. Huang closed that location two years later, shortly after debuting a uh, larger East uh, Village establishment that closed this week. He subsequently opened a Los Angeles output, which has since closed as well. So all of these have been affected by COVID, I'm assuming, and there's just no way to kind of get around that, unfortunately. And Eddie Wang as well posted a message on his Instagram regarding such, so we can get up on here. This is the following. Uh, it's a picture of the restaurant from the outside with the neon lights on that says at the, at the bottom I put the back signal up one last time it says my ace ram 268 put the light on at Bauhaus NYC one last time we held out as long as we could but we have decided to close shouts out to the customers that ran in thinking we were open it means a lot it's been a wild and fulfilling 10 year ride with Bauhaus, house but i'd be lying if i said i can't believe what's happened i opened this restaurant to tell my family's story through food at a time when no one else was giving asian americans a chance on tv film books or other media in general i told people not to call me a chef because i knew this was just a jump off and it doesn't stop where, when it's closed uh with its closing sorry boogie is locked uh, the movie is coming and so is chino's we will continue to tell our story and Bauhaus will be back one day. I've seen it like a 27 inches and if believe it. Shouts to everyone that put their hearts and souls into this restaurant, especially our leader, JJ Kingman. Love all y'all. And of course, Evan, who opened it to me. And thank you to all our customers and everyone who believed in us. The infamous Bauhaus lives on and we will not let you down because ain't no such thing as a halfway cooks. An amazing one there. So, um, yeah, so a really, really sad state of affairs. And again, just another further indication of just how real COVID is, not it? It's kind of hitting everybody. It's hitting my little industry. It's hitting my little scene. It's hitting my little area of expertise. And it's affecting people the world over. So, if you do have the option or the possibility to put food on the table, you know, to keep a roof over your head, to put some warm clothes on your back, be thankful for it because people are hurting in their own individual way. And, you know, the best way that we can kind of help each other is to be compassionate as best as we can, because, you know, 
um, you can just imagine, I guess for Eddie Wang is fine because he's going to carry on doing his stuff and turning into this media behemoth that he's obviously going to be able to turn into. But imagine everyone that works behind the scenes, the shoe chef, the cleaners, um, front of house people, you know, bartenders, whatever, who are working at an establishment who are now going to be without a job. It's a pretty bleak times, but at least they were able to go out with some level of a bank. We continue here. We've got, what else do we have? Ba, 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 ba. Oh, we've got this mad story. Mad, 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 mad. This is from Vulture. So I'm, I'm assuming most are aware that SNL happened, what, this weekend? Bill Burr did, was the comedic guest. And then I think they replaced um this guy. Who's his name? Ba, 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 ba. They replaced, what's his flipping name here? Morgan Wellen with, I'm going to say Jack White. But originally, this guy called Morgan Wellen was meant to be the musical guest on Saturday Night Live. And he got himself in a bit of hot bother over the weekend. And then he had to essentially be pulled from a show. So it's the story from Vulture kind of describes it. And it's a pretty rock and roll story for a pretty, you know, uh, basic sounding country music star. So it's a bit of a sad one, but also maybe a cautionary tale as to how to manage your entertainment career, especially when you're given the opportunity to perform on Saturday Night Live, which is a pretty, you know, unique experience in itself. So I've been told. So this is from Vulture. It says, SNL's next musical guest spot. I'm sorry, spent the weekend kissing and partying, Max Street. <laughs> oh, this is like an episode of one of those um, TikTok kids, isn't it? It continues, says, during the coronavirus pandemic, Saturday Night Live is already taking a huge risk by producing live shows with in-studio audiences inside Studio 8H at the 30 Rock. And now a new risk has been introduced. Country musician, the voice alumni, uh, Morgan Wallen, who SNL announced last week would perform the show as musical guest on October the 10th alongside first-time host Bill Burr, spent the weekend partying with and kissing crowds of must-free people, mostly women, I'm going to say, while spending his time at Oh, was that Tolasco, Alabama, according to multiple videos circling on Twitter and TikTok? God damn it. So, again, I don't watch any of these shows, so I don't know, but I'd imagine being a what is he, alum? He's a Britain's Got Talent, was it? American's Got Talent, some sort of talent show, right? The Voice alum, and also being a pretty successful country music star in America, especially in about Alabama, is going to make you fairly well known, right? You're going to be fairly recognizable. People are going to know what you look like, especially when you look at him, right? He's got a mullet. He's got a pretty clean shaven face. He wears, you know, Western inspired attire. You're going to be able to spot him out from a mile off, especially with, with the promo and the marketing that went into promoting um, his appearance. Well, you know, his appearance that he was meant to be on on Saturday Night Live. So really, really uh, bad move from him. So again, notice to up and coming rock stars out there. If you're going to go on a lash and decide to, you know, throw out your family and your career for a little night of partying, don't make sure it's not during the same week that you're about to be announced you know or, you, or that it's been announced that you're going to be the musical guest at snl try and do it on a dead week you know maybe the week when you're winding down your tour or something i don't know if you're gonna throw your career do it that time not now it continues it said as one local news report described it, Wallen, who posted a photo on Instagram of himself attending a football game at University of Bala, Alabama sorry, on Saturday, October 3rd, is seen in the clips posing with fans in a tea town, downing shots, kissing girls and playing the guitar and generally making merry at various locations like a bar at the house party in the backseat of a fan's car and more. He got into the fan. That's a proper night out, isn't it? That's when you actually get loose, isn't it? You end up in some stranger's car. You end up in some stranger's home. And you probably end up in some stranger's bed, in it. And in his case, that was the occasion. Wallen and other people in the clip aren't wearing masks or taking any kind of precaution. It's like watching some alternate reality where COVID doesn't exist. And that's always what happens. And again, you get this, you get these little snarky, weird, you know, sentences in most of these articles. But it is really gnarly, isn't it, when you stumble across when you stumble across a picture or a video of people out and about, you know, gallivanting and enjoying themselves now. Sometimes you you sometimes look at it and you're like, hold on, was that from last year? And you look at the dates posted, you're like, nope, it's actually from last week. It's really weird to kind of wrap your head around some people just, you know, pretending or just acting as if it's no big deal what's happening, which is fair considering the mortality rate, considering who it affects and blah, 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 blah. But still, you would think there'd be some level of fear. But I guess we've been, maybe as a, maybe as a society, we're so overly stimulated, right, that... Maybe, you know, this silent virus isn't doing anything to excite us. It's sort of like a crappy Netflix show 
that's got all the sparks and glitz of a really great TV program. And then you watch a couple of episodes, you don't get it and you move on. That's maybe what coronavirus is, isn't it? Like a really bad Netflix TV series. It continues, says, watch some clips of him getting down. So this is what I've seen, eight, like 87 TikTok or similar. Morgan Wellen belongs to the streets. <laughs> Look at him. Oh, God. You got, you got, you've got a, you've got a, um, you got a feel for the lad, innit? Found myself in this ball. Oops, sorry about that. Let's let's mute that music because that was loud. Oh, it's, it doesn't really matter anyway. We 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 can see what he's doing. He's there downing a shot, being a lad, just not giving an absolute care in the world about what's happening. Fair enough. Another one. He says, let us take a moment to recognize that Morgan Wallen is a total dirtbag. Most of the girls in his video are 19. Okay, have a Kirk, relax, right? Mentioning that he's, you know, drunkenly kissing 19 year olds isn't necessarily, don't get me wrong. Is it immoral? Yes. Should he be doing it? No. Is he probably going to lose his wife and family? Probably. But to suggest that he's some kind of pedophile because he's lipsing up random 19 year olds is a bit unfair. He's 27, so what? Like, it is what it is, isn't it? He's a rock star. They're going to always be helping up with these um, tight-skinned, thin ladies at parties, aren't they? And here he is again. Uh, smooching on people. Gallivanting around. Let's play this. Yeah, yeah. That's, hard. That's a hard one to watch, isn't it? If you're, if, you're, um, if, if you're dating a guy, Jesus, Chris has got his whole hand on that upper leg, mate. God almighty, going in for the kill. How many girls did he bloody get his lips on then? About there's already what three separate ones on this video. One with the brun with the top black top on brunette. This one, second one, third. Is that a fourth? Jesus Christ, mate. He went ham in it. Is that the he's he's acting as if this is the first time he's ever been outside whilst he's been famous. But, you know, what, what can you do? More videos of him getting absolutely <laughs> wasted with fans. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, I can't do that because the music is terrible. We continue. Um, Side Night Live, we'll be taking those precautions, blah, blah, blah. And then what else happened? And con to continue. Yeah, I think that was it, it for that one, right? Jesus, Chris. Oh, update. Yeah, there we go. Update on September the f October 3rd. Um, it looks like Morgana's weekend antics were ultimately deemed too much for the risk for the show. On October the 7th, one announced on Instagram that he would no longer be appearing on the program after popping up all over social media. Uh, but, but let's see what he actually said. I'm interested to see how he explains this away. What do you say when you've been caught red-handed uh, with people that don't look like your wife at a party with loads of teenagers? It must be an absolute mad situation to try and explain when you get back home, in it? Like, God almighty. You go to the missus, oh, I'm popping out for a bit. I'm going to go on Saturday Night Live. All right, cool. I'm going to, I can't wait to see you. I can't wait to see you play on TV. And then bang, it comes through on the, on the, on the TV that you've gone through this. And again, I've got sympathy for the lad, isn't it? He's young, you know, I guess young in terms of entertainment wise, right? He's only 27 years old. Being famous um, at that age um or maybe quote unquote that late in his career isn't an easy thing to do so i think people need to probably lay off him a little bit and give him time and space and i'm sure for his family it's probably not the best of times in it so let's just allow the guy to uh to what to learn from this as he can but you know we've got to get these jokes off so let's hear his apology what's up guys it's morgan it's a tough video for me to make um, <laughs> but a necessary one and I just wanted to let you know ahead of time that I actually did write some stuff down because I, I got a lot to say. And this is something that I take serious. <laughs> I love how, like, when people get caught red-handed doing these type of things, they make these apology videos and make it seem as if, I don't know, like, um, make it seem as if, like, they were somehow... Were they not under the influence? Like it was, like it was something that was out without the something that wasn't in their control. And it's like, no, it wasn't your control. You chose to do those things at that period of time. It maybe it was a poor choice, right? In considering his uh, relationship status and what what not. But you n knew what you were doing. You did it. Just fess up, you know, admit your mistakes, and just move on. But this kind of, you know, I've got a lot to say. There's a lot on my mind right now. It's like, there's not much to say, really. I'm pretty sure your wife has a lot more to say than you do, mate. Trust me. And I don't want to miss anything that's in my heart. So if you see me looking away from the video for a second, that's why. Um, I'm in New York City. 
in a hotel room. I was getting ready for SNL this Saturday. Fio's brother, man. And I got a call from the show letting me know that I will no longer be able to play. And that's because of COVID protocols, which I understand. I'm not positive for COVID, but my actions this past weekend <laughs> were pretty short sighted. I'm surprised he's not positive for COVID, right? Rip, what's that? Lips in five, four girls on camera. Like, the ones that you've just seen, you would think you'd get something, but you know, maybe because he's, he's a, he's a, what you call it? He's drinking on the saliva of teenagers. Maybe that does something to you. <laughs> and they have obviously affected my long-term goals and my dreams. <laughs> I respect the show's decision because I know that I put them in jeopardy. He seems really guided about the show, more so about, you know, embarrassing his family. Don't you think? He's mentioned the show seven times, but no one mention of his family. <laughs> SNL over the fam all day, eh? Okay. And I, I take ownership for this. Uh, I'd like to apologize to SNL, to my fans, to my team for bringing me these opportunities. And I let them down. And on a more personal note. Oh, there you go. I think I have some growing up to do. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think I've lost myself a little bit. I, I've tried to find joy in the wrong places. And... Mate, come on, man. Come on. I don't know. It's left me with less joy. So I'm going to go try to work on that. I'm going to uh, take a step back from the spotlight for a little while and go work on myself. Um, I wish I could have made country music and my fans proud this Saturday, but I respect the decision once again. And, and Lauren Michaels actually gave me a lot of, of encouragement by letting me know that we'll find another time to make this up. So that means a lot to me. Thank you for that. And lastly, I, I know that I'm taking some heat, a lot of heat. <laughs> But uh, I just wanted to let you guys know that your messages of encouragement haven't gone unnoticed either. It may be a second before you hear from me for a while, but uh, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go work on me, and I appreciate <laughs> y'all respecting that. Oh, the difficult life of a country music rock star. God Almighty, what can you do? What can you do? Moving on. Another embarrassing celebrity moment. We have this really peculiar video. Um, it seems like um these celebs don't learn, innit? it? They don't learn. They made that really dumb video where they're like, "Oh, when was that? What was that thing with that Jesse guy from flipping, um, Breaking Bad was in it? Talking about, oh, we gotta learn, we gotta learn, we can't do this anymore. And now we've got this really bizarro video with celebrities deciding to strip naked in order to encourage." American citizens to vote in the upcoming election. Um, part of me thinks this is like a a sketch, and it's not really a real thing. Um, but you know, knowing what I know of celebs and people in Hollywood and the things and the lengths at which they would go to to make sure that they are front and center on your mind and that they are entertaining you, this is probably the antithesis of it, isn't it? Right, stripping naked so that you can pay attention to said individuals is the memo or the mo of most celebrities isn't it this is the this is kind of textbook narcissism um to say the very least and there's also a part of me that thinks there there has to be like and make, again i'm not american but i don't live there not, the point is none of my business but i'm sure there must exist a section of people in america who see this sort of stuff and will just spite vote they'll decide you know what I've had enough of these people telling me to vote. I've had enough of them instructing me or gently nudging me in the direction of where I should place my vote. I'm just going to spite vote for Trump just so I can kind of see those guys howl and scream and threaten to leave and move to Canada and never follow through. It must exist. That surely must exist because I, I, I know if that was me and I was over there and I saw these celebrities, some people who I actually looked up to, some people who I kind of looked at as heroes deciding to strip naked to encourage people to vote i'd be like what the fuck is going on 
So this is it. It's a, a tweet from now. This says the following celebs, including Sarah Kirk, Sarah Silverman, Tiffany Haddish, and Chris Rock. Three pretty decent high level comics. So with the exception of Tiffany Haddish, who's not had a uh, that long in stand up, but you know, three legitimately funny people, right? Especially in Hollywood, not like fake funny, like legit funny. Are stripping down to bring attention to naked ballots and encouraging voters to follow vote by mail instructions. Like, what the hell is this, man? It really makes no sense. Let's play it. I'm naked. I am completely butt ass naked. I'm naked. Legit, like, you know, not to comment on women and, you know, what they look like and stuff, but. Naked. I'm naked. Is, is, um, what's her face not the most ugliest naked. one that exists? Like, that face. Jesus. I'm naked. I'm like naked. There isn't a man behind me. These are my hands. <sighs> Why you want me to be naked? I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Ruffalo, um, put your clothes on. To be honest, I wish I could cover my hands with my boobs, but here we are. I'm here to talk to you about voting. <sighs> Everyone's talking to everyone about voting, isn't it? People are simply trying to keep, you know, to keep the lights on, you know? Keep the, um, what are they called? What are they called? Keep the bailiffs away. Make sure their kids are not sick in school. You know, keep their marriage intact. And these people are telling you to go and vote. Vote, vote. It's the most important thing you, you can do. Listen to me. You know that you know that TV program you watch on Netflix? I'm that person from that show you watch. If you listen to me, your life will be better. Like, what? Did you know that ballots could be naked? And if you don't do exactly what I tell you, your ballot could get thrown out. This is uh, my ballot. Just got it. First and imagine the pressures of being a celebrity, a holy, especially in the entertainment industry, where you get that notice, you get called by your agent or your manager, and they tell you, hey, guess what? They, they want you to do a little sketch where you strip naked and you encourage everyone to vote. I know, I know. It sounds crazy. It sounds crazy. Are they paying? No, no paying. It's just exposure. Okay, cool. But where's it going to go up on Instagram? No, it's going to go up on Twitter, on the Now This account. It's got over millions, I don't know, however millions of followers it's got. You're going to get on there, get naked, and it's going to boost your profile. All right, cool, do it. Just because no one's paying attention to their own Instagram, no one cares about a TV interview they did because, you know, people just don't give a shit. So they want to get in front of the eyes of people, so they just do it for the sake of doing it. Or some of them feel compelled to not turn away and not kind of reject that call because they feel as if it might impact the possibility of getting other jobs i'm sure that must exist you're thinking damn it they asked me so the moment they ask you you just kind of have to do it because you're involved in that hollywood ecosystem but jesus count me out first of all when your ballot comes you're supposed to read the instructions read and follow the instructions that come come on chris rock man i've just fallen back in love with chris rock he's on fargo season four and look what he's doing come on with your ballot if they say to use a black pen use a black pen of course chelsea handler's there isn't it if anybody likes to likes to sound their own voice or likes seeing themselves in front of camera you know berating the public uh about some indiscretion that they're doing is so uh, chelsea handler isn't it? i know that's like literally the least sexy thing a completely naked person could say but uh, but, but i have crumb like a can of pepsi is problem number two <laughs> In some states like Pennsylvania. 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 There are two envelopes you have to stuff your ballot in. Otherwise, it's called a naked ballot. Naked ballots. <gasps> and you don't want to have one of those. Number three, mail your ballot in as soon as you can. Don't sit on them. Get those things out ASAP. Like now. Do it. Get it in as soon as you can. I got to get some my ballot to the mother post office let's go please oh i don't know what to say man i think it's a troll most of it has to be a troll it just has to be it really does have to be a troll by now it's not i don't think it's serious it can't be serious it, it legitimately cannot but if it is we pray for them we really do moving on moving on moving on so i listened to a pretty decent podcast uh called free economics i'm sure most people are familiar with free economics they have a pretty decent book that they put out a few years ago that i read but um a really good episode called uh is new york city over episode number 434 a really interesting debate you know on both sides of the aisle whether or not in, uh, cities are essentially over due to covid with people migrating to other parts of the country or countryside and i've noticed you know especially in london for the most part that 
especially my circle of friends nothing has really changed in terms of where people are living maybe people's um lifestyle choices and expectations for work and um quality of life aspirations have essentially changed but in terms of location not as much that this may change when we get a better idea as to what the lay of the land is but i feel like the people who would have moved have probably moved already and the ones that weren't going to move are still here that's basically the point because i think you know get packing up your bags and deciding to find pastures new now especially in the midst of this sort of second peak or the second spike that we're on at the moment probably is ill-advised but I do think we're going to see a shift in um, the desire of people, especially the people that live outside of cities, to kind of run into the city. Whether or not it happens the other way around, I'm not too sure. But I do think that would happen. Um, it, it, it's, just, it's just bound to, isn't it? London, especially for where I am now at the moment, it's just too packed. It's way too crowded. There's not a lot of housing available. Um, the ones that are available are grossly, grossly overpriced and you know just in terms of job prospects and stuff it's not the best place you know your compete is probably there's probably way too much competition for uh the level of jobs that are available right there's competition for cell assistant jobs for instance right just working in a retail store it's difficult just to get a job in there you have to kind of get a recommendation or maybe get a link up or just be fortunate to apply um so many times that your thing just gets pushed up the list wherever it may be so i can only imagine what um it must be for like jobs where you know essentially they're only 10 a penny and they require a particular sort of skill set it's definitely going to increase the level of competition in that regard but i think in terms of co-working spaces we're definitely going to see a change in attitudes there we're going to see possibly people deciding to use those kind of things more often especially if you've got your own building you've got your own office that you're paying exorbitant levels of rent in times of there's no real need or no real point of doing so you're probably better off deciding to cut your costs and deciding to you know uh, place everything in one unit that will probably make sense going forward um, of course you have the benefit for the company on their side to have the ability to have uh, you know access to far better levels of talent or you know a, a better talent pool to choose from because you're offering people to work remotely there's loads of really big um uh things that will probably get explored once the economy gets back to some level of normality going forward but i think the episode itself on free economics uh, episode 434 was a really interesting one really illuminating kind of opened my eyes as to what's kind of going on um across the pond in america you know very, very similar to what's happening here you know new, new york city is one of the most so they say densely populated cities in the world it might be number one um and kind of london sort of functions the same sort of way that's just one thing i realized when i went to new york actually how similar it was to london just in terms of kind of the energy and and the way people move around the city the food options the way things are located had the similar sort of vibe around and of course you know they have the benefit of being a city that never sleeps but definitely check out our episode free economics episode number 434 it's called is new york city over very very informative we move on ba, 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 ba. Uh, what else do we have here oh we have this really distressing news regarding a, a northern island teen named around the sudden deaths of four young people in england so this kind of sparked my interest of course mostly due to the picture of the young lady a very pretty young lady that unfortunately passed away and i think to myself no nah, no way is there some sort of serial killer on the loose or something and then you read the article and you realize that this is an unfortunate or unintended consequence of some of the restrictions and rules that have come into place due to covid that have negatively affected teenagers especially those who are kind of leaving the nest and deciding to go to university you know without the help of parental supervision and with friends who are not necessarily acting in a very friendly kind of way um getting them in situations that are resulting in their unfortunate timing or their unfortunate passing so that's because of the following an 18 year old student from our mic has died suddenly at a university halls in newcastle upon time at the weekend jenny lamour uh i was only weeks into beginning her studies at newcastle university an 18 year old man has been arrested in connection with her death he is currently in police bail while the investigation continues a statement said mr Moore's next of kin had been informed and are being supported by officers at this time in a wider statement Northumbria police said they are investigating after tragic deaths of four young people including the more another 18 year old woman and a 21 year old man in newcastle as well as an 18 year old in the town of washington a statement said investigations are very 
very early stage, but drugs are suspected to be the factor. And that's what broke my heart in it. Um, you can just imagine, especially with these kids now at the moment, they're essentially being locked up in their halls due to the, you know, spike in COVID, in positive COVID cases. Some of the university halls, most of them, most of them aren't lethal or most of them are, you know, life threatening cases. Most are just testing positive as long as they remain under lockdown or under quarantine. They're going to be OK after the 14 day period. But of course, universities are pa panicking and doing it all that they can to ensure they don't get any more bad press than they've already received and you know if you leave teenagers alone in their rooms for a prolonged period of time so what they're going to do they're going to try and occupy their times and of course the best and sort of like easiest way to do so is to drink and do drugs and if anything university should be a safe place to do both things right it should be a place where you should be introduced to your tolerance or your limits or your ability or your liking for or dislike for either of the things especially you know if you meet a good enough friendship group but i would imagine with the fact that people are essentially not doing anything at university locked up in their rooms unable to go to even lectures having to have food delivered to their dorms overpriced food as i reported in the other uh, podcast regarding is it northampton university over overcharging uh, students for the delivery of food right that i think the meals came up to about three pound and they were charging the students 17 pound or something obscene even though they collect you know thousands if not millions from students coming through their doors every term so these kids are going to university they're trying to pass the time they're trying to make the best of a bad situation and they end up doing way too many drugs for their level of tolerance and their level of experience and unfortunately in some cases especially if the drugs that they're taking are tainted or they're not a particular quality or they're just not you know physiologically um a good matchup for certain things because that also does happen um they're put in the uncompromised they're put in a compromised position where unfortunately for some they lose their lives and it's really tragic it really really is tragic because again like i said it should be a safe space you should be able to experiment with drugs and alcohol at universities at university um, with your friends um in a safe environment um you know they are fun they can be a fun experience but there does you do need to have people in your group who are able to maybe coach you through it um i know from my experience that the best thing to do or the best thing is that if the, the best thing in a group of friends is that there's, there's one person who kind of is the uh the one in charge of making sure you know the things that arrive are of a good standard whether it's you know getting a hold of a test whether it's getting the whole making sure you're purchasing of somebody that's a good recommendation a friend of a friend who's also purchased the things of that person there are ways to go about things but again leaving kids alone in those circumstances is only going to lead to one thing and it's really really tragic that this has kind of happened and again i hope um, once COVID is over and once we get back to some level of normality, um, the people that were, you know, responsible inadvertently to the situation are held accountable for their actions because, you know, people's families are being torn apart, not only economically, but also tragically due to these untimely passing of young people at universities. Man, it's a really, really horrible story, but I thought I'd highlight that one there. But, 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 but we move on. What else do we want to talk about? Da, 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 the oh, oh, so this is an article here from Rolling Stone magazine. Um, a fairly, what did you say? A fairly sobering article actually from the Rolling Stones magazine, reminding myself and others within the nightlife scene that, um, however optimistic that we feel about things going forward, that we probably shouldn't, especially if you want to go and party and rave again something that i've been missing you know for the longest time especially i think maybe since the winter months i've actually kind of been thinking fuck man how amazing or how fun would it be to kind of be able to go out now and party and you know throw your hands up in the air like you just don't care and do all that good stuff but unfortunately you know needs must stay indoors you know remain in place all that good stuff so this article here from rolling stone says the following coachella will reschedule its date again so i think you're aware that prior to covid wreaking havoc on most of the world i think coachella might have been were they the first or am i bugging out or they're the last i'm not too sure but regardless they were one of the first ones i remember seeing deciding to postpone their dates i think twice or something they just pushed it back and then they decided to push it back again to the following year you know not essentially cancelling it i'm assuming if you don't say you cancelled something you are kind of protecting yourself from liability reasons and all that malarkey but essentially they cancelled it and said hey we're going to throw it again next year with the exact same lineup so this article says the following it said they're going to cancel it again until april 
2021 instead. So here's the following. Sorry, 2022. Yeah, 21. Yeah, 2021. I want to talk about it. Continues. Um, it says Coachella was supposed to take place in April 2020, but when COVID 19 struck, the festival organizers pushed the event to this month. Um, and then again to April 2021, after the virus cases in the US climbed all summer. Multiple music industry insiders now tell Rolling Stone that the 21st edition of Popular Music Festival will be pushed back for a third time to October 2021, which goes into line with the article that I mentioned in the previous podcast from a former WME um, executive who said essentially we shouldn't expect concerts to come back again until 2021. I'll just get up there. Let me see if I can load that one up again, but let's let's just move on to this one. But it continues, says, sources have been um, in direct communication with AEG and Golden Voice, the concert promotion companies um, that organize the festival, so they have been asked to prepare for a move to the fall. And again, it's probably no surprise for us in the nightlife scene. I think we've kind of come to a realization that, you know, most likely than not, we're going to be the last industry or the last sector of the economy to reopen. We're the first to close, we'll be the, we'll be the um, last to reopen. And just, you know, unfortunately, due to the how COVID spreads, it's probably not conducive to have these events. But there is a part of me that thinks, if you're able to implement some level of rapid testing, if you're able to limit the capacity, if you're able to ensure that there's a steady airflow and all these sort of, you know, re, um, um, adjustments are made to the club in order to pr- make sure that it's COVID secure, I think we could get around that. It really is an issue. It really is a possibility because to expect, you know, bars and clubs around the country to stay, you know, to be essentially unemployed or be unable to make money, um, unable to put on events, unable to support their staff and the wider community for what another year, it just doesn't seem like it makes any sense, does it? Um, but again, like I mentioned, we probably should have been. Um, this should have come as no surprise, especially considering this article that I that I kind of spoke about on a podcast that was published in July the seventeenth, right, early this year. Um, this uh, executive said the following: Mark Geiger. Until recently, the head of music of WME, one of the founders of Lollapalooza, sounds like he's not expecting to be attending any festivals in 2021, right? He already said in July, when well, nothing's going to happen uh, next year. He said the following, Arks under Bob left his podcast when he expects concerts to return. Geiger said, my guess is late 21, more likely 22. So when I heard that f- at first, I already, ha- when I, especially when you hear it from industry professionals, people working with some of the biggest promoters and, you know, music festival organizers in the world, it's definitely a bit of a marker, a bit of an indication of how the entire industry will go. You know, there's obviously a trickling down effect, you know, um, some of the from the biggest or smallest events they need to ensure that they go through without any hiccups the last thing you want is to put on an event rush it and then have swaths of people catch covid which could potentially turn you know turn into loads of civil cases which could potentially end up you know uh, tanking an entire network so no one wants that smoke so you want to make sure you're putting on an event in the safest possible time to ensure you have no liability going forward and unfortunately you know event spaces and you know uh, people that work within the arts are the ones that are going to suffer so this is the following and this original article gotcha is 100 percent moving again one person who works with a major talent agency represents popular music performers told the rolling stones he said frankly they were supposed to announce the change over labor day but they hadn't and they were supposed to announce at the end of september but they hadn't the sources say they have heard from golden voice ceo and coachella um co-founder paul tullet office that the new date will either be the first or the second week of october 21 but they're holding their first three weeks to be safe uh, all artists have confirmed availability that is insane insane in it so the festival that's meant to go on t- later on this year later on this year it was pushed back to april of, of next year is now going to be pushed back to october most likely the beginning of the year so again for yourself can you wait until next year october this time next year to go back to a festival or a rave can you wait if not let me know in the comments down below i'd love to know your thoughts and opinions and then a very interesting observation from a german virologist called christian drosten he's sort of like the 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 fauci of germany essentially telling us that we're going to be wearing masks for another year so don't expect to be maskless until then. And this is a message basically to the anti-mask uh, people out there at the moment, but listen to what he has to say. How much longer do you expect this corona pandemic to go on for still globally? 
Well, it's, it's very difficult to, to make global projections. We have very different, difficult situations um, in countries around here, um, in Europe. Um, the winter will not be an easy one. Um, we will have vaccines during um, the next year to come. That's encouraging. Um, I, I guess it will last until end of the next year until significant parts of the population can be provided a vaccine. So um, we, we won't uh, get rid of masks anytime soon. Uh, so even while we start vaccinating, the population in, in largest parts will have to wear masks. Um, in countries like Germany, where incidents... Jesus. That's a tough one to hear, isn't it? Until but, end of the next year. But I think most sensible people would have come to that resolution, right? Or realization that we're probably going to have to wear a mask until the next year. Um, I would like to see a little bit more of a uh, creative approach, though. Like I said previously, I would like to see some places adopt the Swedish model, you know, try to implement herd immunity. Other places decide to go, you know, to hold onto the mask until the end of next year. Other places you know, try and push forth this vaccine that seems like by all intents and purposes is going to break all records. I think the last vaccine that was able to be provided on mass was essentially developed, I think within a four year period, a four year window, right? So if they're able to do that, if they're able to turn this around within two years or 18 months, it's unprecedented. It goes against anything um, that I basically heard experts say is normal. Um, so if they're able to do that, amazing for everybody. But still, to roll it out to the entire population or to roll it out to, you know, the people that do want to receive it, it's going to be really difficult. That's going to be another operation in itself. So I guess get comfortable wearing the mask in it. Get comfortable putting that thing on, strapping that bad boy. And when you go into, um, you know, crowded areas, when you go into shops, when you go into private businesses, uh, when you just go out and meet your friends, and if they tell me, hey, the only way you can go out to meet your friends and hang out is to put on a mask, I don't think that's a bad um, sacrifice or bad sort of uh, thing to make for the time being. I don't think so. So, you know, it is what it is. We, ha we will have to make adjustments in these crazy times we're living in at the moment. And I think that's one of them. Moving on. Um, next one update. We have an update in the Tory Lanez felony case. Uh, or the Tory Lane shooting case regarding Megan Thee Stallion. So this is from TMZ. It says the following, Tory Lane's felony charge in a Megan Thee Stallion shooting. So he's formally been charged. Finally, we have a date uh, set for arrangement. We're also going to be having, I guess, court dates going forward, depending on whether or not people are going to be willing to come up and, you know, testify and all this sort of malarkey. But we might finally come to some level of a conclusion as to what occurred on that God forbid a night where, where that started off with so much promise, right? They were frolicking in the swimming pool, Kylie, Megan, Tori, having fun, being kids, being young in LA, as Jordan Wood said, quite iconically. And then somehow it kind of transpired or it kind of went into complete disarray, which resulted in somebody allegedly getting shot, somebody allegedly getting some wound in their foot and many broken hearts all over the place and friendships, right? Like, I think since then. Megan has basically got rid of her entire team, right, since that occasion, which makes sense, isn't it? If you're involved in such a traumatic um, event, you're probably going to look at your team and say, hey, what could you have done better to ensure that I was in that situation? Because you would imagine her being the star, you know, they'd have to go above and beyond to ensure that she's safe and well looked after because she's essentially the person that's paying for everybody's, you know, that she's one that's paying for everybody's night. She's ensuring you get into the best clubs. You don't get into Nobu or these, what are these places called? Harry's or whatever they called without her on the guest list. So this is an update from TMZ. So the following, Tory Lanez has been charged in connection with the shooting involved Meg The Stallion just weeks after the singer released an album claiming his innocence. Um, the LA County DA's office hit him with one count of assault with a semi-automatic firearm and one count of carrying a loaded, unregistered firearm in a vehicle. The DA also alleges Tory inflicted bodily, great bodily injury. Of course, being charged is in the conviction, but that does read quite heavy in it, especially when he could, especially in the context of the album. You think to yourself, God, that album sounds a whole lot toxic when you see these charges. But again, a charge is not a conviction. It continues. If convicted, the rapper and singer faces up to 22 years eight months in prison now the thing that stuck out to me was this this unregistered firearm in a vehicle i'm sh 
that that's always a big issue in the states isn't it um having a red a fire that's not registered to you um and obviously it being loaded blah 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 blah, blah. but I have a feeling this might be a real big issue going forward. So keep an eye on this charge here. Um, I think if he's able, if he's, if what he said in the album is true, he might be able to prove that he wasn't the one that inflicted the, the actual bullet that hit or whatever ricocheted off and hit Megan on the foot. But this might be a real problem for him. So definitely keep an eye out for the unregistered firearm in the vehicle charge. It says he convicted, he faced up to 22 years. As reported, the, pursuit, the prosecutors um, has said that they were mulling over a charge of felony assault with a firearm against Tori, um, said that she shot him back in July. Remember, Tori had been arrested but only charged with possession of a firearm. Prosecutors are now explicitly pointing the finger at Tori as the man who pulled the trigger, leaving Meg with a gruesome foot injury, which we saw the picture. It took um, Meg some time before she went public and accused Tori as by name as the person who shot her. She didn't mean her words saying yes that a nig shot me <laughs> you shot me and your publicists and people got to these blogs lying shit stop lying which looking back seems a bit odd and again it, it, if it did happen that way if it did and you are going to the police or there is an, a pending investigation going out on your instagram and telling everybody you know pointing the finger and telling everyone who did it is a bit bizarre and who knows this may come back and bite her in the butt as well because i think this court case is going to be very interesting um especially if you consider what megan said in the beginning like oh i didn't want to get anyone in trouble right i didn't want to get anyone in trouble so let's see how far you take that because when you get called up to a witness will you follow through with your promise not to get anyone in trouble or will you want to put this behind you and provide some witness testimony to a pretty gruesome experience it continues here the article says the following it says as we reported sources connected to tori say that they were mitigating circumstances and based on what we know we believe tori is going to say yeah it was an accidental shooting megan didn't help the da's effort with a social media caption which has since been deleted that said that he um that said that she had her back to the suv when she was shot in a hill that might indicate she didn't see it with her own eyes when tori allegedly pulled the trigger uh jesus christ so yeah we might finally get a conclusion to this and tori decided to reply on his socials he said the following time will tell and the truth will come to light i have faith in god to show that love to all my fans and people that have stayed true and to me know my heart the odd thing about the statement is this he says a charge is not a conviction of course which is fine he says if you have supported me or meg through this i generally support you i appreciate which is odd that he would mention meg's name in it again i'm not sure if that means they're back on good terms if he's still fishing for her love or whatever it may be but i was a very odd to mention her in this um um tweet especially when you think that she might be essentially responsible for his downfall if this case ends up going forward um you know to a level that people are expecting it to so i think this is this may be again it makes it makes people that are on either side look a bit silly in it that this is going to court now the ones that are like staunchly like, oh, he did nothing wrong. And the ones that are like, no, he's the one, he's evil, whatever. Da, da, da. It's like, at the end of the day, we're going to find out what eventually happened in that God forbidden car when they eventually go to court anyway. There's no need to occupy such fringe or such kind of strong positions either way because we, we weren't there. We don't know exactly what happened, but we're going to find out once this all washes out in the sun so let's see what do you think do you think he's guilty do you think he's not guilty do you think you'll plead not guilty or do you think you'll plead guilty i'd love to know let me know your thoughts in the comments down below okay let's move on in move on up move on in move on up move on in we had this really interesting uh, uh what was it clip that i saw regarding what's his face uh mr kreischer where can i find it now i think it might have been on another page let me get it up on here a second let's move this let's get this up on here it's regarding mr bert b-r-t-e kreischer having an issue with another fellow comedian that made me laugh let me see if i can get that up on here bear me a sec there we go so Let's find it here. Let's get this up on the screen. Press pause so it doesn't play too loudly and it doesn't burst your eardrums. Bear with me one second. Let's see if I can get this up. Oh, yeah. Let's pause it. Cool. So, um, I guess this is, I'm assuming this is recent. I'm not too sure how recent this actual clip is, but um, I stumbled upon this clip thanks to the homeless cats for pointing me in the right direction. But concerning a fellow comedian, I guess, in the scene, 
who decided to go on a bit of a tirade and basically call out Burt Kreischer for being a bit of a bad dude and not being a good guy and all this malarkey. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, which is probably part of course in this standard procedure within the comedy scene. And it? it seems there's a lot of infighting, a lot of jealousy going on within the uh, people just being bitches in general and not really seeing um, the situation or seeing, you know, success in the entertainment industry for what it is, right? Just a matter of luck in some cases, right? It is basically a flip of a coin who it ends up being the person on a massive Netflix poster somewhere, you know, on the Broadway of LA, right? Is there's, you know, every, I'd, I'd assume again, Again, for me as I look at it I'd assume most people work to you know work hard everyone works with a particular standard people do spots appearances they write a lot they record stuff um, they record their set they go over what they did the previous day they tweak they hone um, all that stuff you see on like a Mark Norman vlog I assume most comedians do that if that's the case then you know I would assume if you're like 10 years in and you're pretty decent at what you do and you've honed a craft, you've probably got a good hour under your belt or maybe a good 45 minutes. Um, it is really luck of the draw as to who becomes the next big thing, who gets opportunity to get a special, who gets opportunity to get a TV show, um, to sell out, you know, stand up gigs around the country. It doesn't necessarily mean that if one person is successful, that it negates any, I think, in your journey. And unfortunately, this guy doesn't seem to understand this, but he just, and again, picking on Bert is probably the easiest one to pick on because, you know, his comedy is a little bit, no, his comedy is great, but his persona might make you think that he's a bit of a doofus when I don't think he is. I think he kind of plays up that whole dumb, dumb kind of jock dad persona. But let's continue. This is a clip of uh, some comedian, I don't know who his name is, uh, deciding to go on a rampage about Bert Kreischer regarding all the things that he hates about him. So let's hear what he has to say. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a big Bert fan. Oh, here we go. It's on my here. podcast, so That's I awesome. listen. Yeah. So there's one episode to listen to from your podcast. I, I've had guys like, I had Norman on and Bert. Not good. You're he's been on my podcast, so I That's awesome. listen. Yeah. So there's one episode to listen to from your podcast. I, I've had guys like I had Norman on and Bert and all the fucking players for all you comedy fans. They're all been on. Bert Kreischer? Yeah. Did he do this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not a big Bert fan. Yeah, I know. It's Bert's fucking, a it's Bert's a cunt. Out. He's all, it's all marketing. <laughs> I love this guy. I was, yes. I was I was open for the show. <laughs> See, like, what are you gonna do? Like, not let me open for you? <laughs> We're done. Your wife's a nice lady, but you're a fucking bitch. You're a terrible comic. You're not good. You're. And again, what what is that game, right? What is that game? Especially during this um, crazy times that we're going through at the moment, disparaging a fellow comic who's, you know, going through the process as you especially if you consider like the actual allegations here are what that he's a bad dude for doing what precisely not deciding to have him open for him because he's mentioned that in passing that probably is the, the the crux of the issue right i'm assuming he wasn't able to get a gig's a guest spot or he wasn't able to go on the road with him or something along those kind of lines which is you know uh, a, a thing that I've always had an issue with, like with people in general that only speak up about people whenever they kind of do them wrong. But other than that, they basically keep their mouth shut and just kind of, you know, go along with it because it's benefiting them. And as soon as it doesn't benefit them, they quit to kind of free under the bus. I don't think that's fair whatsoever. This picture of Bert is probably horrible as well, by the way, with his chain on with the, on the mic. But hey, um, that, that I don't think is fair. If you're going to call somebody out, call them some, call them out for an actual thing that they did, right? As opposed to just, oh, because they didn't help me out on my stand-up or they didn't give me the op option or the op opportunity to open for them on the road. Um, doesn't make sense to me. You're marketing. It's all marketing. Marketing, 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 marketing. Shirt off, drinks, blah, blah, blah. It's marketing, marketing. Oh, you wake up every morning going, oh, how do I market this? How do I market this? That's it. That's your life. He's not a bad person, but he's marketing. I will say nothing wrong with that either. Being a boy and a good marketer, like I've seen this a lot in even my world, the DJ world. There seems to be a little bit of a confusion as to like how people make it or get successful. Yes, there are those that exist who are purely, you know, successful due to their talent or their ability or their looks or whatever it may be. But for the most part, it is a lot, of, especially in this era, right? Especially with the advent of a smartphone everyone has the ability or the possibility or the option to be their own PR 
right? To be their own marketeer, to be their own social media manager. Why wouldn't you take the opportunity to do so? And unfortunately, if you do want to amplify your talent, if you do want to be able to reach the masses, you're going to have to have to embrace marketing to some level of point of view, to some point, right? You're going to have to embrace it to kind of sit there and, you know, and hope that times go back to, you know, when David Tell was blowing up and doing his thing that's not going to happen anymore you know that isn't going to exist if you want to be you know a stand-up comic of any sort of notoriety or have the option to you know work certain shows go certain places you're going to have to get your voice out there and i don't and i think you know the best person to basically learn it from if you're on the road would be a bird crusher right he's probably the best at marketing on social and don't get me wrong is it annoying to go in his profile sometime and see you know a million dots on his stories about him kind of trapezing all across the states and kind of interacting with his friends and getting his big fat red face on camera and laughing and giggling and heezing everywhere yeah but it's pretty cool as well to see that he's always on always creating content always documenting stuff working on ideas writing you see the process kind of unfolding and then you kind of get a recap of the stories when he goes on a podcast it's quite cool to see that sort of thing and imagine if you're a stand-up comic and you actually are working within that industry and seeing a peer of yours you know blowing up on that platform precisely that should be encouraging especially when you think about how he blew up right the machine was a story that he didn't want to tell but he as he has he famously describes it that interaction he had with joe rogan he tells the story to joe rogan joe rogan says hey you should be telling this on stage he finally tells it on stage he gets recorded he puts, he puts it on he puts it on facebook i think that was due to his special as well right they didn't do too well he took a clip out he took the clip off from that special put it on facebook it blew up and then he suddenly becomes this massive massive star right far bigger star than he was prize selling out arenas or selling out stadiums no selling out arenas selling out comedy clubs right and then kind of building up from there onwards and now he's what doing these amazing car lot shows where he's essentially you know got hundreds of cars in the car lot and people honking their horn and hollering and watching him do stand up on a massive jumbotron when he's on stage like, that's pretty cool all from marketing so it's don't don't poo poo if you unless you've done it yourself say this about bert kreischer he has the machine story that is hilarious and he doesn't that not really if you look at he the machine story, it's not that good Christ. it's not that good hold on <laughs> let, me, let me get to my fucking point can you can you yes and for a half a second over here <laughs> and punt <laughs> and punt <laughs> oh i still have that on the board i just i just like that and punt no he has a, he has one story that's entertaining and funny he's milked that what's surprising about bert is that and what's wrong with milking a moment What's wrong with milking something that's going your way? What's wrong with trying to get the most out of what little attention you're finally getting in your career? What's the problem with that? Some of these comedians are very bizarre. I don't know how they expect to become successful if they don't want to market and they don't want to milk moments that happen in their career. Very odd. You can't get away from him. He's on everyone's podcast. He's on 3,000 podcasts that he hosts himself. He's constantly putting out content. I reviewed a show recently where he's... You can get away from him. You just stop following the, the places that he's on. If he's on a show that you like, you just skip that one. If you don't want to look at his face, you don't follow him on social. Like, that's one of the most bizarre things I've heard anyone say on comedy. Like, part of the reason why you want to be everywhere is so people don't forget your face, right? So they can... they You're kind of always living in, in their head rent-free. And it seems like, even though they're kind of denying that he's kind of, you know... Um, uh, his ability as a comic he's essentially occupied you know mind space uh for free for what just being himself in it eating peanut butter on a podcast which is by the way eating food on a podcast sucks eating peanut butter is the worst thing you could possibly eat the, and the guy's nasty the, one of the previous two bears one cave he was talking about eating his bogeys and stuff right i just skip i just fast forward or i just click x you know the little chrome tab there boop, and keep it moving and the next show i tune in again that's what you gotta do on a podcast and this is what he's putting out his content and somehow he's still very popular i cannot figure it out and that therein is the essence of the issue and you know like i said um in the previous show you know sometimes the worst do make it do succeed but also there is the case where i think even bert will be he would be he would admit it the most out of most people he says it uh, numerous times which i have a lot of respect for him about the process no about the um the role luck played in his career something people don't mention too often 
you know after we've gotten past the hard working bit after we've gotten past the you having the ability to do the said thing that you're doing right because a lot of people get into stuff especially in the creative in the arts where there is no barrier for entry right as long as you've got a passion and you want to do something you can basically do it no one's going to stop you from playing the guitar but once you get past your proficiency of playing it and whether or not you're good or not objectively and we get past your hard work most of the success in the entertainment industry does come down to luck it just does right um is, is he's lucky that he's what a comedian in this area he is lucky that maybe he was um you know on tv yeah with the travel channel he's lucky that he ended up being friends with joe rogan lucky that he's best friends with tom segura lucky that he's you know decided to pursue his stand-up comedy career in la and not in new york there are all these things that are kind of you know went his way that you could deem as lucky but essentially you got to put yourself in the game to be lucky you got to allow yourself to be in a position where you can capitalize or take advantage of that luck when it comes your way. But to suggest that he's somehow, you know, a freak of nature, that he's just got lucky. That's why he's successful. The only reason is really doing him a disservice. And again, that's kind of for me who's, you know, I can be a bit hot and cold with him, right? There's sometimes I'll listen to him speak, especially when he's kind of going this whole self-deprecation thing when it comes to his drinking and all this sort of stuff that gets annoying. But most of the time, you can have to respect the hustle. You have to respect his ability to continue creating, continue kind of embarrassing himself and making himself the ridicule of the internet, right? Subjecting himself to terrible comments on social media, right? Being friends with Ari alone should be a reward in itself. Um, of course, luck is going to play a, a, a root or an aspect in his success. Why, why would it, do, it would work in my success too? It should work in yours as well. I will tell you this now. I used to open for Bert. I'm a guy. I know him. I know him very well. I have his phone number. He's not fun to hang out with because he's just looking at his phone the whole time. Like the, oh, he's he's recording himself. Weak source. Is that what you're complaining about? He eats peanut butter on podcasts that you can tune out of. He didn't take you on a road. Um, his machine story wasn't funny, and he's on his phone when you're talking to him. Come on, weak source. Or looking at Twitter. <laughs> so like that's what that. it is. I'm sorry, guys. I, I know you. I'm I'm raining on your parade about the the machine. No, and you, listen, you're he's not, not a you're not raining on anyone's parade. You're just making yourself look like an absolute loser. Imagine the one you're picking out to kind of you know pull up and say, oh, he's not that good at what he does. Is but imagine that's the one you're calling out of all the people to call out. Of all the people that you could accuse of being hacks, of all the people you could accuse of essentially using stand-up comedy in order to get, you know, a better position or to, in order to kind of rewrite the narrative of their career or people that are basically disrespecting the craft, right? Of all the people you can call out, this is the guy you want to call out. It says more about you than it does about him, really. Not a bad per he's not a bad guy. He's not. But he's a fucking narcissist who wants to be famous that's all he wants to be well it's duh like, isn't that isn't that like the description of all stand-up comedians or everyone working in the hollywood industry isn't that, that that's it isn't it that's describing everybody comedy he doesn't care about the comedy vehicle to get you there he pretends he does but he doesn't because david tell is the best comedian of all time agreed he is yep and for me like i'm like i'm team mattel burt kreischer is just marketing he just wants to be famous so so you're comparing Burt Crash with David Tell. No one's going to stack up well against David Tell. Even flipping Dave Chappelle wouldn't. No one will. That's a pretty uh, poor equivalency there. Fuck Burt. If this ruins my <laughs> career, I'm fine. I'm good. I, 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 I did very well. I love this podcast. Yeah. You can tell you did very well that you're complaining about what... When did this happen? I bet this happened like ages ago as well. He's doing so well that he's complaining about a slight, um, you know... And, and again, I bet you this is something that he's only perceiving in his own head too. I bet you this happens a lot to people, isn't it? Where you perceive a slight in your own mind, you work it up into such an issue, right? That it sort of kind of outstrips what is actually happened on the day. I bet you that's a thing. <laughs> this is great. I love it. Yeah, uh... Bert, fuck him. Cunt. He's a cunt. Kreischer, done. Fair enough, isn't it? I guess, isn't it? I guess he has to keep that same energy when he does see the guy in real life. But again, like I said, man, I, I think this sort of that kind of loser energy isn't something that I would ever condone. I think, in fairness, whether it comes to whether it's even to Brendan Schaub's or this world, whoever they are, right? It's fun to kind of poke fun at these kind of people. But hey, if they find a way to be successful in a lane or in an arena that they kind of, you know, um, get some sort of joy out of and fans enjoy what they do 
that's what matters at the end of the day if you're a comedian within that circle and you're wondering how they did it maybe there's some things to learn about their approach their work ethic um their marketing abilities um who they align themselves with their network all this sort of things and that you can maybe apply in your own career and if not just ignore it i don't understand people just not being able to ignore things that they don't like it really is especially with covid especially with covid right if ever there was a time for you to kind of recalibrate and think, you know what, what do I really want to be doing in my life? What do I really want to be spending my time on? This should be it. This should be the time where you should be like, you know what, I shouldn't be worried about the next man. I shouldn't be worried about what they're doing over there. I shouldn't be worried about this missed opportunity or this perceived slight that was done to me. I should be concentrating on my craft and making sure that I'm the best at what I do so that when a chance comes along my way, when luck does kind of, you know, shine down on me, right, I can take advantage of it as opposed to poking holes in what others are doing because it makes you feel better. Nah, I'm not with that whatsoever. I'm not with that whatsoever. Okay, I think that might be, yeah, the Action English Show, episode number three at seven, as per usual, it's turning dark and I forgot to put the light on, so that's perfect. Yay, and now I look like, you know, I look like Noir from uh, from uh, The Boys, actually, innit? Uh, I look like Noir if I put this, right? <laughs> Anyway, that is episode number three of Seven Stage and Zing Show. Thanks so much again for tuning in. If it's your first time tuning in via YouTube, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast, please leave me a five star review and share the show with your friends. And as per usual, as per usual, you can support the show via Patreon too. Make sure you keep the link down below, pin comments, and also in the show notes description, click patreon.com for Agostino. Support the show on there. And I'll see you guys again for another episode again tomorrow. Until then, take care, be safe, peace.